welcome to the keynote podcast from Kingdom Faith. Today's message is by Pastor Colin Urquhart. You are so glorious, Lord. Lord of glory. Lord of glory. Lord of glory. We worship you, our sovereign Lord and King. Oh, thank you, Lord, that all your plans for us are good. Thank you, Lord, that you want us to walk in your ways so that we can walk in the goodness of all that you have prepared for us. That your word says you have prepared good things for us to walk in. So we thank you and we praise you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Let's grab a seat for a little while. How our heart attitudes determine the way we think, the way we speak, the way we act, the decisions that we make. So um, we want to move on from there. God is still always concerned with the nature of our hearts, with what's going on in our hearts, not just what's going on in our heads. Now, God always wants the very best for us. He has given us his best, he's given us his son, he's given us salvation, given us his kingdom, given us his spirit. That's true for every one of us in this room. So that in itself is evidence that God wants his best for us. But that's not only what he's done for us through Jesus right at the beginning of our Christian life as we're born again and receive the gift of his spirit. But he wants the best for us every day. Remember that this agape love of God seeks the welfare of those who are loved. So God is concerned about your welfare, my welfare, every day. He wants each one of us to be living in the good of what he has done, in the good of what he's given us, in the good of the spirit, in the good of Christ within us, in the good of his kingdom every day now how far we do that or fail to do that is all dependent upon ourselves the only one who limits God in your life is you God has no desire to limit faith, to limit his love, to limit his power, to limit his joy, to limit his peace. He's got no desire to do that because he's already given us the fullness of his life. He's already given us every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. So God never wants to limit us. So the only one who limits God in your life is you. So you might think, well, you know, I want God to do more of this, more of this, more of this, more of this. And the Lord says, okay, I'm not withholding my blessing. I'm not withholding my life. I'm not withholding my kingdom. I'm not withholding anything from you. It's up to you. How much of the life that I've imparted to you impacts your life day by day? So that's our responsibility. Now, Jesus puts this in a number of different ways. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness And everything else will be added to you. Everything else that you need will be given to you. That's what he means. So that shows us God wants us to have every need met. So he's saying, right, all you've got to do then is to seek first my kingdom and my righteousness. 
And then everything, everything that you need will be added to you. It's up to you. We <clears throat> saw last week the prayer promise of, of Jesus. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. So that shows us God wants us to be in the place with him, in relationship with him, whereby whatever we wish, whatever we express in prayer, he gives to us. So if we're not experiencing that, that's not his fault. It must be our own fault, our own responsibility. That in some way we're not abiding fully in him and his words in us in the way that he intends and in the way, therefore, that enables such answered prayer in our lives. So we have to do a little bit of mental gymnastics here by which I mean we've got to change our heart attitudes and therefore our thinking. It's not God who is limiting the blessings in your life. It's you that are limiting the blessings. Hello? He has already blessed you with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. So, you know, if you think you're lacking in anything, it's not that God is withholding it from you. It's because you, for some reason or in some way, are not entering fully into or taking hold of by faith what it is he desires to give to you. So, Jesus says, anyone who has faith in me will do the same things as I've been doing. So, as far as Jesus is concerned, every one of us is able to do the same things as he did. And that's not just healings and miracles, but it's living in the same way that he lived. Same love, same joy, same mercy, same grace. He's made it all possible. He's given us all the riches and resources that we need place those within us, not just made them available to us. So he says, well, it's down to you now. How much you live, express in your life the fullness that I have already given you. So we can look at things in a kind of upside down way really when we say Lord I need greater blessing or I need more anointing or I need you to do this I need you to do that and all the time the Lord is saying no I've done it you keep asking me for what I've already imparted you see the scripture says every one of us has the anointing of the Holy One And that anointing remains. Now how can you improve on the anointing of the Holy One? You see, there isn't any greater anointing. That's the highest anointing. And the scripture says that's the anointing that is upon every believer, not just upon those with specific ministries. So it isn't that we need more anointing from God, but we need to flow more fully in the anointing that he's already imparted to us. That's our responsibility. Now, he will give us all the grace uh, to enable us to do that. And this is where we come back again to what we were talking about last week, the nature of our hearts. Now, not only the nature of our hearts, but where we choose to set our hearts. Paul says, set your heart on things above, not on things below. 
on heavenly things, not on earthly things. And that's really probably the major part of the problem, isn't it? That so often our heart is set on earthly things. Now, if our heart is set on heavenly things, does that mean we're going to be, you know, so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good? Which is a common saying, you know, there are those who are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. But actually, that's a complete distortion of the truth because the more heavenly minded you are, the more good you will do on the earth. And Paul was aware of that, which is why he said, you know, set your heart. Don't just occasionally glance, but set your heart on things above. Now, your flesh, your self-life, wants the things of the earth and wants you to focus on the things of the earth, on satisfying your fleshly desires, your your natural desires. And when Jesus says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you, of course, he's not talking about earthly desires. He's saying, if you are living in me and my words are living in you, then you're going to be seeking first the kingdom of God. You're not going to be seeking first the fulfillment of fleshly or simply natural desires. Are we getting this? Don't look so somber. This is good news. Because what God wants to do is to release us from having the wrong focus in our lives and to make sure that we maintain the right focus. So again, the scripture says that we are to fix our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. Now, as you analyze what Jesus has said and the way John shows how the principles of Jesus are outworked in the life of the believer, which is really what he's doing in his first letter, it's obvious that two things are essential, are faith and love. Now, there's an old hymn which expresses a a great truth. Trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. What is trust? The outworking of our faith. What is obedience? The outworking of our love. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. So the person who says, I love God, but doesn't obey what he's doing, is just deceiving himself. He's living on emotion and not on the truth or on the the reality of what God wants to do in his life. So trust Jesus and obey Jesus. That's the walk that he's calling us to. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. Faith and love. Faith and love. The two balance out each other. There are people who would claim to be great people of faith, but they don't demonstrate much love. There are other people that claim to be, you know, full of love, but they don't demonstrate much faith. But for the believer who is going to be true and faithful to Jesus, the two go together. They are like two sides of the coin, trust and obey, faith and love, faith and love, faith and love. So our faith is not in what God needs to give to us. Our faith is in what he's already given. Our faith is not in what he needs to do. Our faith is in what he's already done. So if we're seeking first the kingdom, it isn't, that doesn't mean we're looking for it, but we're seeking to allow the rule and the reign of God that he's already put within us to be expressed in our lives. Everything is under 
the rule and the reign of Jesus Christ. He is Lord and King in every area of our lives. That is freedom. To bring everything under the dominion of Jesus, under the lordship of Jesus, is freedom. It's freedom from the world. It's freedom from the enemy. It's freedom from, from the power of sin. It doesn't mean we will never sin, but it's freedom from being under the dominion of sin. It's freedom in order to enable us to fulfill the purposes of God. So, God always addresses my heart. He always addresses your heart. He never addresses the head. If you notice, Jesus was a heart man. He always spoke right to the heart. If you, if you think for a moment of, of the parable of the sower, the first uh, category was the seed falling on the path. Now, it didn't take root, did it? So the birds of the air came and ate the seed. And Jesus explains that's the enemy coming and stealing what? The word. From where? From the heart. That's what he says. So even, even the seed that falls on the path, those who reject the word, God sowed that word into the heart. Satan was allowed to snatch it from the heart. Now this demonstrates that God always speaks to the heart. Even, even to those who reject him, he is speaking to the heart. Even those who reject the word, he always addresses the heart. That's why you see in the Gospels that there were lots of issues that Jesus never even addressed and and spoke about. He didn't address the whole business of slavery. He accepted that slavery was part of the culture of the time. But Jesus knew, you see, that if the heart is right, then the actions will be right. The words will be right. The motives will be right. The thoughts will be right. Everything will be right. It all depends on the nature of the heart. So God is continually cleansing, renewing, reviving our hearts. That's his purpose. He wants, uh, this is why David prayed, create in me a clean heart O God and renew a right spirit within me. When he sinned grievously, he realized that the problem was his heart. That if his heart was right, he wouldn't have committed adultery with Bathsheba. He wouldn't have uh, arranged for her husband to be killed so that he could marry her. What was really wrong was his heart. So he could ask for forgiveness for the sins, and God would forgive the sin of adultery and murder. Those were the two big ones, weren't they? He could forgive those sins, but he realized even receiving forgiveness for those sins was not dealing with the problem. The problem was his heart. That if the heart was right, he would never have committed those sins. So at that time, you see, his focus was not on pleasing the Lord. His focus was on Bathsheba. His focus was not on heavenly things. His focus was on earthly things. And so because his focus was on those earthly things, he actually committed two serious sins that clearly affected his whole relationship with God and caused him to have this heart cry, have mercy upon me, O God, against you, you only, have I sinned? Now you would say, wait a minute, he sinned against Bathsheba, he sinned, sinned against Uriah, her husband. 
in having him killed. But David obviously perceived something even deeper, even more important, even more significant than that. He said, against you only have I sinned. Now, what's he getting at? He's getting at the key, the key truth. And if you get a hold of this, this will affect your life for the rest of your life. Against you, you only have I sinned. What's he getting at? My worst sin, Lord, was not the adultery, was not the murder of Uriah. I committed an even more grievous sin than that. My sin was to act independently of you. That was worse than the adultery. That was worse than the murder. Against you, you only have I sinned. What does David realize? He's repeated the sin of Adam. That's why, just as Adam's sin had immediate effect upon his relationship with God, so the sin, it wasn't just the adultery, it wasn't the murder that affected David's relationship with God, whereby he lost his sense of salvation. Restore to me the joy of my salvation, he had to pray. He'd lost even sight of that. Why? Because he'd acted independently of God. He repeated the sin of Adam. He knew that he was doing wrong in the eyes of God. He was choosing deliberately. So it wasn't just the sin, it was the heart attitude towards God. I prefer this to you, Lord. I prefer my will to your will. A deliberate act of independence. That caused him to lose his sense of closeness to the Lord, his, the joy of his salvation. He knew there was a way back. But the only way back was for the Lord to have mercy upon him. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, have mercy upon me. Against you, You only have I sinned. So a heart that is truly submitted to Jesus, to seeking first the kingdom, to have him ruling and reigning, is going to be a heart that will not make choices independent of Jesus. Now, you notice that Jesus never did anything independently of his Father. I have not come to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. I can do nothing myself, I do only the things I see my Father doing. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. 
the Father and I are one. Right, now, what's God's desire and intention for every one of us? To be able to say, Jesus and I are one. I live in him, he lives in me. We are one. Now, that's not a position that we're aiming for. That's the position in which he's already placed us. That's what it means to be reconciled to God. That's what it means to be redeemed. That's what it means to be saved. Jesus and you are one. That's your starting point. And because you're one, he wants the best. He wants every spiritual blessing. He wants the life of his kingdom. He wants the fullness of his life. He wants the fullness of his spirit to be revealed in your life. That's your starting point. You're not trying to accomplish or trying to achieve or working your way towards that point. That's the point at which you start. Now, as you walk in unity with him, trust and obey, faith and love, so you live in the good of that fullness. You express the life of his kingdom as fully as is possible in your life at this time. But when you make wrong choices, when you choose to do deliberately that which will please you and grieve him against him against him only have you sinned it's not just whatever the wrong action was that needs forgiveness okay you get forgiveness but it's the attitude that underlies that and that's what David came to realize. The, the real problem is not the sin. The real problem was my wrong attitude towards God. I thought I could, I could ignore his word. I thought I could ignore his will. I thought it wouldn't matter if just for a moment I grabbed what I wanted for myself. I never thought through the consequences. I never, I never really thought through what am I doing in relation to my God? I'm denying my God. I'm acting independently of my God. I'm saying what I want is more important than what God wants for me. And then he came to realize, I've robbed myself. It isn't that... That God has taken anything away from me. I've robbed myself of the joy of my salvation. I've robbed myself of the freedom. I've robbed myself of enjoying the close unity and fellowship that I have with my Lord. I've robbed myself of God's best. And so it is a cry of desperation. I've got to get back to God's best. I've got to get back to the reason why he called me, chose me and anointed me. Because David was the chosen one, the anointed one. that moment he was feeling how far from God have I fallen not just the sin but he's, he's, he's thinking you know in the past I would never have treated God like that I I would never have thought the will of my God doesn't matter. What I want is more important. I would never have thought like that. What has happened to me? What have I done? Not in relation to Bathsheba and, 
And Uriah, but what have I done in relation to my God? Oh God, have mercy upon me. Restore me. So Jesus comes on the scene and he points us in the right direction. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and what is right in his eyes. Then you won't have to take for yourself what you want for yourself, but everything will be given you by your God the right things in the right way at the right time you won't have to take God will give you see in God There is always a right timing for everything. When we try to make happen what God intends, before it's the timing, the perfect timing he has for his will, we're trying to push God into doing something that we want rather than being sensitive to what he wants. So every day, God wants his best for me. Every day he wants his best for you. How many times have you messed up? And you've thought, oh God, why on earth did I do that? Why on earth did I make that decision? You regret it. You regret what you did. You regret what you said. You regret the decision you made. You come to realize, yeah, that was the wrong thing. Or that was the wrong timing. Or that was giving in to the wrong desire. And you ask for his forgiveness, and he gives you his forgiveness. But then another situation will arise, and the same thing will happen again, and it's the wrong decision. Why? Because, you see, we recognize our need for forgiveness, but we don't always recognize the worst sin was that we did that, with a wrong heart attitude towards God. That independence. I thought I could do what I wanted. Instead of being sensitive to what he wants. Against you, you only have I sinned. Now listen to me. I'm going to give you a secret now. Very, very simple truth. But take this to heart. Most Christians ask God to forgive their sins. That would be like David saying, forgive me for the adultery, forgive me for the murder. But to ask God 
to forgive your sins is not the same as saying, Lord, forgive me. You see, my sins are just a product of me. The real problem is not my sins, but me. I need forgiveness, not just of my sins, but I need forgiveness of a wrong attitude towards God that caused me to sin. So David doesn't pray, have mercy upon me and forgive me my sins. He says, have mercy upon me. Against you, you only, have I sinned. I'm the problem. Not my sins. I'm the problem. My heart was not right before you, God. So what's the Lord saying to us through all this? Our focus all the time has to be on Jesus. Our focus all the time is to fix our eyes upon him, the author and perfecter of our faith. That we're seeking first his rule, his reign in our hearts and lives. See, the interesting thing is that when in the parable about the kingdom, where Jesus says it's like treasure hidden in the field, he didn't say Jesus is the treasure hidden in the field. He didn't say God is the treasure hidden in the field. He said his kingdom, his rule and reign in your life is the treasure. When he spoke of the pearl of great price, he didn't say I'm the pearl of great price. He said the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is the pearl of great price. It's having the rule and the reign of Jesus in your life that is the treasure. It's the rule and the reign of Jesus in your life which is the pearl of great price. So Jesus doesn't say, seek me first. He says, seek my kingdom first. Seek my rule and reign in your life first. Now, of course, David (coughs) couldn't have the kingdom within him like New Testament believers could. But the same principle, you see, he realized he was called to be a king and he knew what it meant to rule and reign. And, And... he realized, I believe he, he, he came to realize that if he was not submitted to the rule and reign of God in his life, that would affect his ability to rule and reign over the kingdom, the, the natural kingdom. That, that if, if he was, hmm, dare we actually say rebellious in his attitude towards God, which he was at that time, then that would sow seeds of rebellion in other people towards him. He would reap what he sowed. And so he came to understand it's for the good, not only my own good, but it's for the good of the, of, of the natural kingdom, the kingdom, of the ministry, if you like, that God has called me to fulfill as the king of the nation. It, it's, it's for the good of all the people that I keep my right focus, my right relationship on God. So you see, what this teaches us is that when, when there's that, that independent attitude, when we, when we do what we want and don't even think of the Lord, that's going to have a repercussive effect on all those around us. Because at that moment, we're, we're not able to express his life 
his love, his power, his joy, his freedom. And so bless all those around us in the way that God intends. So, you know, David came to see my relationship with God has suffered because of my wrong attitude towards him. And now the nation is suffering. And we know the seeds of rebellion that even in his son. And how much that grieved David in his life. So, you know, we're living in the real world. And God is the great restorer. God is, is, is the merciful one. He's the, the one that always wants to put us right with him. But he wants us to understand keeping in that right relationship, walking with him in trust and obey, trust and obey, trust and obey, faith and love, faith and love. It's going to have repercussions on all those around us. Just as if we grieve him, that will have negative impact. Negatives will flow out of our life instead of the positive life of the kingdom. So, what are we really saying here? We're saying, God has been so good. He's been so gracious to us. He's given us everything. Fullness of his life, his kingdom, his presence, his spirit. He's withheld nothing from us. Every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. The anointing of the Holy One. given us so much but together with all those gifts is he's given us the responsibility to live in the good of all that so you see really our heart attitude towards God defines us defines the kind of people we are defines what we do defines how much fruit we will bear in our lives for his glory defines who is really at the center of our lives Ourselves or Jesus? Defines who is on the throne. Jesus or self? What David realized was that at least for a time he had dethroned God and placed himself and his desires on the throne of his life. And the consequences of that were so awful. He said, have mercy upon me. Oh God. Listen to Jesus. Inside, in your own hearts, you are full of greed and self-indulgent, blind Pharisees, if you first clean the inside of the cup and dish, your own heart, then the external things will also be clean. Jesus says on another occasion, it is what comes out of a man from his own heart that makes him unclean. Such things as evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deception, lust, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. These evils start in a person's heart. 
See, if the heart isn't right towards God, the sins will inevitably happen. The sins are not the problem. The sins are only the symptom of the real problem of the heart. These evils start in a person's heart, and these are what make him unclean before God. Another occasion, Jesus says, the good man does good deeds because he has a good heart. The evil man does evil things because of the evil in his heart. What a man says is the product of the nature of his heart. Then, again, talking in parable of the soul, however, the good soil consists of those with good, sound hearts. They not only hear the word, but maintain their trust in it, and because they persevere in their faith, they produce a good harvest. Then Lord Jesus also says, for your treasure is where you choose to set your heart, in this world or the next. Jesus knows it's all about the heart. He's done and given to us everything that God has to give. Now he wants the people with a good heart to live in the good of all he's done, to reveal that life, that love, that power, that authority, that joy, that peace, that freedom. And to bear the fruit that will give him glory. So it's a bit of a serious word this morning, but a joyful word, you see. Often the most joyful things are the serious things. Not somber, but serious So we're going to pray now, or rather, you're going to pray. Each one of us is going to pray. And what I suggest you do is you you get before God. Don't think of a catalogue of sins. I'm sure if you're conscious of sin, you've asked God to forgive you. He's forgiven the sins. But I want you to focus on Lord Forgive me. My sins aren't the problem. It's when I have a wrong heart attitude towards you. That's the problem. And therefore, in your heart, to surrender afresh and to keep, you know, in my experience, I have to keep doing this. Every day of my life, I have to keep surrendering my heart, my, my whole being, spirit, soul, and body, to the Lord I've got to keep in that place with him whereby I can enjoy the best that is his desire for me because if I'm not enjoying his best it's not his fault there's something wrong with me and I have to I have to come into that place where I can enjoy, know, live in the best because that's what he's given me and that's what is his will for me and for you. So let's all stand, shall we? just getting warmed up for Italy because we're going to have some revival in Italy this weekend hallelujah praise God okay off you go there's Jesus and there's you what do you want to say to him perhaps you realize The real problem is that 
still that desire sometimes to do your own thing, to act independently of him. That's the real sin. Just say, Lord, forgive me. Not just forgive my sins. Forgive me, Lord. You've got to pray it. Come on, let's hear some. <clears throat> Don't just think thoughts. Speak the words. You don't have to speak them so loudly that others can hear. But <coughs> Form the words on your lips. Have mercy upon me, O oh God. Against you, you only, have I sinned. Forgive me. Deal with me, O oh God. I want you to deal with the heart issues that still cause me to prefer myself rather than you at times. Forgive me, Lord, for all those acts of independence. When I've repeated the sin of Adam, repeated the sin of David. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. A heart submitted to you. A heart that seeks first your kingdom. A heart that seeks first your righteousness. A heart set on you, Lord. A heart that is set on things above, not on earthly things. Oh God, forgive me when I set my heart on earthly things and not on heavenly things. I know the things of this world can never satisfy, but only you, Lord, can really satisfy the desires and longings of the heart. Lord, I thank you for your mercy. I thank you that you have mercy upon me, O oh Lord. Praise your holy name. Praise your holy name. Praise your holy name. Thank you, Lord, you want the best for me. And the best is only to be found in you. The best is only to be found in seeking first your kingdom, seeking first your righteousness, seeking first your will. In that is the very best. Thank you, Lord, that in that are all the good things that you prepared for me to walk in. Thank you, Lord, that as I seek first your kingdom, you will be working for my good in all things. Because I love you and have been called according to your purpose. And your purpose is for me to walk at one with you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy One. Come and just begin to praise him. In his holiness, in his righteousness.
Praise you, praise you, Lord. Paul says, I pray also for your heart to be filled with light, that you will see for yourself and know in your experience the hope to which he has called you, the purpose he wants to see fulfilled in your life. What is this hope? That his saints, all those who belong to him, will enjoy the riches of a glorious inheritance and that they may also know his power working in them because they believe in him, a power so great that it cannot be compared with any other power. I pray that out of his glorious riches you will be strengthened with power by the working of his spirit in your inmost being. This is so that you will know the presence of Christ in your hearts because of your faith in him. Thank you, Lord. For this reason, my brothers, make sure that none of you has a sinful and unbelieving heart that opposes the living God. Instead, encourage one another all the time, every day in fact. The deceitfulness of sin will only make your hearts hardened against God and his purposes. This is the new agreement that I will make with my people Israel at the appointed time, proclaims the Lord. I will place my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts rather than on tablets of stone. I will be their personal God and they shall be my people. Thank you, Lord. We're your people. We belong to you. We're your children. You're our Father, you're our God, you're our Lord, you're our Savior, you're our King. Praise you, praise you, praise you, Lord. Bless you, bless you, Jesus. Koratabari eletu bakala sitari sandum. Papari eletu bakala sitari sandari eletu bakala zutaba. Pasadabari eletu bakala sitari sandari eletu bakala zutaba. Baza da pari aleto bagala zita di sandari aleto bagala zita di santo. Baza da pari aleto bagala zita di sandu. Pari aleto bagala zita di aleto bagala zita di sandari aleto bagzuto di santo. Baza da pari aleto bagala zita di sandari aleto bagala zuta. Baza da pari aleto bagala zita di sandari aleno. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. A heart after your own heart, O oh God. A heart after your own heart. Purata bari eleto bagala sita di sandari eleto bagala sita. Basada bari eleto bagala sita di sandari eleto bagala sita di santa. Basada bari eleto bagala sita di sandari eleto bagala sita di sandum. Basada bari eleto bagala sita di sandari eleto bagala sita di santo. Pazada bari eleto bakala sita di sandari eleto bakala sita di santum. O pazada bari eleto bakala sita di sandari eleto bakala sita di santum. Lord, I don't want to act independently of you. I want to just act, Lord, at one with you, in dependence upon you, in submission to your will. Oh, Lord, out of love for you, I want to do what you want. Praise your holy name. Thank you for all your mercy. Thank you for all your grace. Thank you for the enabling of your spirit. Thank you, Lord, that as I trust in you, you will never fail me. You will never forsake me. You will never leave me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You are my enabler. You are my enabler. Thank you, Lord, that as I trust in you, as I trust in your spirit, you will keep me walking in the way that you desire for me to walk. At one with you. At one with you. At one with you. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's exalt him. Let's praise him. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Pala tapari eletu bakala sita di sandama. Pala tapari eletu bakala sita di sandari eletu bakala sita. Pala tapari eletu bakala sita di sandama. Pala tapari eletu bakala sita di sandari eletu bakala zutaba. Pala tapari elenama. 
Oh, just know that God chose you. He chose you. He chose you. That's why he's so concerned about you. That's why he wants the best for you, for the person that you are. That's why he's concerned about the nature of your heart, of you. He knows that if everything is right between him and you, then he doesn't have to worry about the issues, about the other things, that you'll get those right. Oh, you might make mistakes, but you will learn from the mistakes. And he will ensure that his plan and purpose for your life is fulfilled. So just thank him. Before we finish this morning, thank him for his concern for you, for his love for you. It's you he wants to enjoy the full blessings and the full benefits of his love, of his grace, of his mercy, of his power in your life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. You want the best for me. Oh, I'm not going to rob myself, Lord. I'm not going to rob myself by getting drawn away from you. I want to fix my eyes on you. I'm not going to rob myself. You want the very best for me. You've given me the best. You want me to live in the best. You want me to walk in the best. You want me to know the best every day in my life. And I'm not going to rob myself by getting distracted by anything else, by drawing aside from my focus being on you and your kingdom in my life. Praise you, Jesus. Come on, I, I believe we just need a great release of thanksgiving and of joy. These things, these things have I spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Praise your wonderful name. Hallelujah. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, beloved, this is a message to work through in your life and to keep working through in your life. <clears throat> keep it in your heart. Remember what it says in Proverbs, store his word up in your heart because your heart will then be a wellspring of life. What will flow from the heart is not sin and your will and your way, but your heart will be a wellspring of life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just turn to all those around you and say, God wants the very best for you. Thank you for listening to this Kingdom Faith podcast. We trust it's been an encouragement to you. For more information and resources by Kingdom Faith and for our other audio and video podcasts, please visit kingdomfaith.com.